Thanks. All right, I gotta I gotta start here for Sorry, a second. Sorry, May. That's okay, okay, it's okay, Fahima, because this you know people want this. So this particular class is about a one of Plato's dialogues about eros. Two two dialogues about eros, but the first one there's they have a tradition where an older man befriends a younger uh, a youth because their fathers are off working they're gone all the time or they're at war or something and they are supposed to be their guides into adult life this is somebody they can confide in someone who will give them advice someone who might find a you know a job or a school to go to or opportunities for them just open the door for them these relationships in Athens became sexual in addition to being a mentor. They were sexual relationships. And so the first dialogue is Phaedrus and he is the sweet young thing, right? He's the one everybody's after. All the old geezers are, uh, want to sleep with them. But Lysias is a professional speech writer and he has tried to seduce Phaedrus by saying, you should sleep with me because I do not love you. And when people are in love, they're jealous and they're possessive and they're obsessive and they denigrate people and they don't let you have friends and they don't let you develop your mind, but I won't be like that, right? You can have all your friends, you can you know, get your education, we will just have this very discreet relationship and I won't talk to people about it. I won't treat it like a conquest. And so um, that's, I was comparing it to friendship with benefits, which is what my students used to say. The first time I taught this, I taught at a school for women where there were some older women, uh, maybe in their thirties or late twenties. And this one woman said, oh, I had a guy try that on me last week. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't have this. So I, you know, I just presented and I see, I wonder what's happening out there in the world. Um, so Rossi just said that it doesn't happen in rural Cambodia, but it happens in Japan in the big cities. Apparently there is that norm it doesn't mean that most people do it or how many people do it but it, it's a thing right people just know about it okay and then may was about to say something when luckily fahima interrupted me so okay may what have you got okay so um i talked about my mentor like i had a i, I have a mentor at one like woman organization um, in which a lot of uh, UW students are also a part of. The name of it is We Do, and um, kind of every uh, every quarter of the year, the organization tries to assign like every person who needs like a mentor. Like um, they can be men or women, but basically uh, they should be able to help like each person with their own like individual like. Um, individual development and also interest kind of like that and I used to have like one mentor she is also from the same country with me but now she is studying in uh, Canada and I feel that it's a really like great experience to have a mentor because actually before I kind of usually just self-studied or like experience everything by myself and sometimes when I made mistakes or something I have like I had no one here to tell me or like to talk to me or like give me some pieces of advice so um, the journey is kind of long because I need to go by myself but since I had a mentor whenever I need something or I like, need a talk or need some advices I can just like send her an email and she just like arranged a meeting with me maybe we talked for many hours and she is like really supportive and I feel like that um that kind of like supportive vibe within the whole organization because like the mission of the whole of the uh, of the whole organization is to support Asian women 
like with everything they need. That's why they assign the mentor with like different skill set and also um, can help people with different things. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I feel that if like um, every every everyone, especially women in Asia specifically, like has a mentor in their life who are like supportive and also like don't judge them based on their mistake, it would be very great. So that's like basically okay. the, the, uh, yeah. could you type the organization in the chat so I yeah yeah that is spell okay it. okay yeah and well, I believe that and I and I believe that many like students um ideally also like draw it. I think so yeah yeah we do okay so yes Here's the thing though. So, Professor, I want to add something. So just like as she mentioned about mentor, and I know you are one who sub support us a lot. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> a great um, example. <laughs> actually, I'll tell you though, the problem is that I can't, I don't have any connections, right? I there are there are teachers who can can get you into a graduate school or they can get you a job, but you know, I'll do what I can, <laughs> but nobody does philosophy the way I do. I would not recommend anyone to go to graduate school in philosophy. Um, and I don't, you know, this material is uh, not gonna get, make you any money, but it's fun to think about. <laughs> so yeah, I can, that's why I do wanna help you out in the ways that I can. Um, the other thing is, um, what would happen, May, if those were sexual relationships? Do you think that would corrupt the relationship? Um, well, actually, in terms of sexual relationship, <laughs> honestly, I don't like know much about this, like because I don't have experience myself, and also like I don't really like do any research onto that, but I want to give a comment on like the friend with benefit that you and Rashi also said before. Um, actually, I I also got to know that term maybe one year ago when like I when I watched some movies, some some US movies, and also I feel that it um, some of my friends like in in my real life also started to have some kind of like friends with benefit, but oh, I feel that. Um, what they really need is like intimacy and like the feeling of love. Like they don't really need sex, um, like they thought. But like because they they've stuck, they feel stuck with life, and like they don't feel any intimacy from people around. So they turn to sex as a way to avoid the reality and kind of like that. So like I I cannot know for sure like if really if it really corrupts the relationship or stuff, but. Uh, from just my own personal experience, like by seeing people around, I feel that like sexual, um, the sexual relationship like really destroy their like their relationship and like let them not see like directly the um, the reality that they need intimacy. Like, they just avoid the facts, kind of like that. Yeah, I mean, I would, I just think adding sex is not a good idea. <laughs> I just think it would totally distract people from what's really, what the young person really needs, right? And um, and the older person is married, you know, so they're probably being unfaithful. It was just, to me, it's just really corrupting things. But um, that's, what, that's what Plato is showing you, actually. His dialogues are showing you all the things that went on that eventually led Athens to become very unstable. And then they lost a war and then they elected a dictator. They elected uh, one of Plato's uncles to bring back traditional Athenian values, which was blind patriotism, blind religion, and putting your family and friends first, which is exactly the opposite of what Greek culture and Athens was about. Athens was about the rule of law and your family and friends are subject to the rule of law, same as everybody else. 
you know, like the Olympics. You can't favor your own people. You have to be objective. And it was about questioning, right, yourself. Remember that self-examination? Uh, Odysseus thinks he's so superior and he's not. And Agamemnon thinks he's powerful and he's not. So the whole culture was... Um, it. Oh, Rupia, could you turn off your um, mic? Could you mute? Yeah, thanks. Um, so anyway, I think this was part of what corrupted Athens was the sexualization of those mentor relationships. Um, so Jana Tool, did you have any reaction at all or thoughts? Okay, Claire? I'm, I'm gonna pass. Okay, Louis. Um, yes, Professor. Um, I'm so sick now, so I cannot keep my mind straight. So I'm sorry for ahead if my word is messy. Uh, speaking of the term of friend with benefit, I actually I have heard about it one years ago. It's not in Vietnam, but the the time that I was in Myanmar, um, I. I, I, I did work with a guy, with a Burmese guy, and he told me about a, uh, his relationship with other girl, about a friendship, a uh, friend with benefit, and actually he also asked asked me if I want uh, in the <laughs> relationship with him or not. But yeah, of course, it's not a relationship that that I am looking for, and I asked him like where he know this term and like this type of relationship. He told me that um, he he know that for the volunteer from Western country because uh, there are lots of volunteer from Western country come to this uh, center. I think 50, 50 or more than that. Um, so uh, when I back to Vietnam and I uh, like kind of, uh, shared the, the term in the internet and asked my friend, I was shocking when I know that this happened with a lot of teenagers at my age, even old, um, even younger, younger than me a lot. So I don't know, I just feel like why people want this relationship, like just come together because sexual things with their commitment, because I think it's not, um, it will not uh, like long for time. It's not left for a long time because we come together because sexual things. So we easily to break up upon that. So yeah, it's just my experience <laughs> about it. And I was surprised when I know that it's happened in a dialogue <laughs> when <laughs> I read the book. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, I also think that really it's very Western, it's very much colonialism because you have to have a lot of money and you have to have, you have to be, you know, assume that you aren't going to be completely economically destroyed uh, by if you lose your reputation, right? Or if you actually get pregnant. So, I mean, I just think it's so insensitive for wealthy Westerners to, to try and act like it's normal and there's something wrong with you, you're developing countries that you don't have these sophisticated ideas. I just think it's all about privilege. Um, does that make sense to you, Louis? Um, yes, it makes sense to me. Uh, it's more than just a difference of opinion. It has to do with power and those relationships have to do with power too. Remember in all those tragedies that the poets are showing how sexual relationships outside of marriage are a corrupting influence on people's judgments. The way Cassandra was used, the way Polyxena was used, the way, right? And so this is just an extension. These people did not understand the lessons of the poets. They're, they're making all the same mistakes. Um, uh, Nahida, do you have any comments? Uh, no. Yes, Professor. 
Okay. Term uh, friendship of benefit is also not legal. So what I say, as you mentioned some points, uh, we have to look at our society as well. So we have to act in this way. Or uh, we, 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 can, we can change some outlooks, which is necessary, but, but not all the things we have to change. Thank you. Right. I mean, the thing that really annoys me is that feminism is about giving women opportunities to develop themselves intellectually, to go to school, to be able to get leadership positions, to be able to influence societies, to be able to be lawyers and doctors, and then be able to get enough respect to actually change the laws. It's not about sleeping around. And it gets so distracted when you just are focusing on, oh, feminists are sexually promiscuous and then all the energy goes on that and you completely forget what really matters especially for creating a better world for the next generation so i find it very annoying <laughs> and a lot of my students associate the feminist movement with just sexual promiscuity because that's what they saw on facebook or something and it really it was not that at all. Um, so we do talk about that in another class that I teach. It's really, it's not just disappointing, it's serious. Because you know, there's all this rape and there's all this abuse and there's all this other stuff. And it just gets ignored, shoved under the rug because we're all worrying about who's sleeping with who. All right. Uh, Bondona, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, yes, Professor, uh, like you said about the mentor, uh, like I, uh, I personally have a mentor, like uh, he sees a uh, school teacher. Uh, I got in, uh, like I got in since my childhood and like she is very uh, supportive, like in every part of life, though we are not connected in every like situation or something. But uh, whenever uh, I face some problem, uh, I don't know how, but uh, she always keep an eye on over me, but she doesn't even like have a uh, conversation between me and not always, not even one. Sometimes it takes a uh, uh, year, uh, like, but she always keep an eye on me. But whenever I face a problem, she will just call me as uh, that you are, uh, uh, you are in this trouble because you did this and yeah, your mistake is uh, here, just correct it or, uh, means like she will say, even she will scold me up, like she will be angry on me. And like, but at the end, like she will say, you have to do this. She's very supportive. And like, uh, yeah, so, uh, since my childhood, I was supportive. Uh, you know, even if I, uh, I came out of my school uh, and I started college and college uh, and like I, I, I got and uh, her support even there. And when I uh, left uh, home, my home uh, to university, at that time also she was there uh, as a back support. And like even now she is like uh, in a back support because like, uh, you know, like uh, um, my country India is like going a very rough situation on COVID like in present time. So like I'm very depressed and like, I feel like I don't know what will be the situation because uh, near my home also the situation is not very good. And like once uh, if a person in the family gets every will support. So like I was really depressed and like I, I, I didn't I didn't know who, with whom to I um, to whom shall I talk. And like I don't know how she came to know and she called me and like I know you are go going through this situation. Don't uh, don't be panic. Uh, you need to get out of this. So like I was very supportive and like, yes. Uh, That's good. Um, actually, uh, another part of liberal arts college. Well, actually, Socrates is the liberal arts, the model of a liberal arts educator. He's been sort of the one that people think of and the one that the college that model was based on um, was that when they interview us for the job, they care about your character because you're supposed to be a role model. 
and and you have to volunteer for things that's part of your job you have to either go to a church and do volunteer work there or you have to volunteer in some other capacity and that's okay with me um i had a teacher who was like that too um it's called en loco parentis there's even a fancy latin name for it it means in place of parents so we have studied how parents influence their children but Sometimes they don't appreciate that the child has their own spiritual calling. And so then they need to go to college or high school and a teacher needs to identify them and lead them in the path that's most natural uh, for them. So that that's Socrates is, is trying to do that, but this sexualization of those relationships was really a, a corrupting influence. Um, okay, Madeline, do you have something? No, ma'am, I don't. Okay, Lakin, do you have something? Um, okay, so, all right, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment on Hang on, I have it written down. Let me find it. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh. Um, so when guys try to convince you to, you know, have a sexual relationship without any love, it's usually just because they are giving into their sexual preferences and they're not, they don't want to deal with the emotions that come with love. And um, I don't think, I, personally, I don't think that that's the best because I think if you're going to get what you need and what you want out of a relationship, there needs to be actual like love and not just sexual attraction. So I thought that was the interesting part was that the speaker was like, ah, yes, you just have to have sex, don't need love. And I'm like, because mm, it makes it better. I feel like love makes a relationship better. So okay sam you got something yeah um so kind of going off of what liz said um i actually have a different thing about that where um sometimes relationships like friends with benefits that type of thing you don't necessarily have to have love you just have to have communication and respect for each other and i think that that's really important and so like a true serious relationship, I think you do need um, love, but for one like friends with benefits, communication, respect um, and attraction, I think are what makes it work. Um, Not just like a guy trying to be like, I don't wanna deal with all that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't wanna get into my own experiences <laughs> here, but um, yeah, I would just say that like, you definitely see those guys that are like, oh, I don't want a relationship at all. I just want someone to have sex with me and leave me alone. And that's fine. That's whatever, as long as they're like honest about it and you know, both parties are okay with it. But then there's also the kind that are like, I'm not ready for a relationship, um, but I wanna be your friend and I want to have the benefits of a relationship. And those are the ones where there's communication and honesty. And like I said, respect. I think respect plays a really big part in it, so. Okay, but but really, there's this huge assumption nobody's getting pregnant, right? Yeah. I mean, if that happens, of course, in the US, it's not the end of your life, but in a lot of other places, it sure is. Um, so there's, yeah. I mean, I, again, I don't- Ma'am. Yeah, uh, ma'am. I I like to add like if 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 like if somebody become pregnant in our country without being committed or marriage before, uh, it like a sin for the people. I don't know why, but like still. No, there's there's a there's a good reason why societies are strict about it because children need stable families, you know. They need an economic source. They need people to take care of them. Um, yes, ma'am. 
societies and laws are pretty blunt instruments. I mean, that's not a very, to be forced into it is not a good way, but I societies just have to acknowledge that children really need grownups to have their back. And so that's why there've always been these really heavy handed laws, I mean, and norms about it, right? There's well, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, going off of that idea about um, norms for um, like pregnancies happening in these types of relationships, um, my parents were in a relationship. They just weren't married when they were pregnant, when they were pregnant with me. And, um, my family is deep Southern Baptist. Um, I'm not, but my family is. And so I remember my mom telling me the story about how my Nini, who's my great grandmother telling them when they found out they're pregnant, that they had to make it right with the Lord and get married in order to not go to hell for having me. <laughs> so, um, I definitely get that whole thing where like, even right now, if that were to happen, I think like if that were to happen to me right now, not being married and I got pregnant, I think my family would probably say the same thing to me, or at least tell me that I have to live with that person and provide for the child and eventually get married. So, but I remember the comment making it right with the Lord. And um, I've had three cousins of mine, I'll get pregnant at 16. Um, and my Nini told them the exact same thing that they needed to get right with the Lord and marry the man, but none of them got married to the man. Um, now one of them's a lesbian. So <laughs> it's a really interesting, interesting thing. But I think a lot of the norms, especially down here in the South, come from religion, come from the influence of right. religion. That's, that's right. And I don't know for the rest of you how much it's religion, but just in a purely secular way, you know, just recognizing children have deep needs for a long time, right? And and you can, they can easily get hurt. We've talked about that. But of course you can get hurt if you stay in a bad marriage as much as, but I mean, it's just, it's complicated. It's just that Athens was taking it very lightly and it was corrupting. It was a power relationship. Look at the way Lysias describes it. The older guy controls the younger guy. And so it's definitely an abusive relationship. And Plato is just pointing that out, that, that you can't have a democracy when you're corrupting the youth like that. Do you remember in Hecuba, Odysseus made Neoptolemus slaughter Polyxena, right? Get, make the young guy do the dirty work. That's really bad. That's another corrupting influence. So using the next generation, you know, for your sexual pleasure or to do the really dirty work is really bad for a society because the young people grow up cynical they grow up thinking that all adults care about is their own gratification or their own power. It's just not functioning as a mentor. That would, that would be what I would say. Um, okay, Untari, do you have something? No, Professor, I will pause. Okay, Al, do you have something? Yes, ma'am. Um... I, I think it's uh, cool to see, like, uh, I was going through some of the earlier readings today, and it's talking about how all these patterns, you know, they're, they're timeless, and that pattern of the, uh, the successful, uh, well-to-do person taking someone under their wing with uh, using sex as a, as a way to say, oh, I'll help you out, and I'll mentor you, but I'll have sex with you is still super prevalent in today's society. And um, it, it's interesting that this is something that's always been there and it still hasn't gotten away, but uh, it's cool to kind of see the root of it almost. It, I thought when I read Plato, I thought, my God, this is like the story of my life. Um, I had just gotten married when I read that. And in the middle section after this, Socrates 
talks about eros and it's sacred and the relationships are sacred. And I remember thinking, oh, that's what I think. <laughs> so yeah, it is, it is pretty amazing. Good, Al. News Rot, what about you? Oh, okay, Margia, do you have something? Rupia? Okay, Poppy. All right, so the other thing I wanted to point out was that I don't teach, um, now I teach the feminist movement as a historical relic because it basically has died and I don't think it should have died. I mean, there's plenty of work left to do, but there's so many women who have completely sold out to the system, they don't criticize it. Now we have a Supreme Court justice who completely defends the system. She just voted to make it possible once again for uh, underage kids, under 18, to actually get prison, a life in prison without parole ever getting out of prison when you do something when you're 17 or 16, among other things. I mean, so I think that it is a problem that it's gotten reduced to things like sexual freedom because we took, the, we took our minds off what really mattered, which is women helping other women achieve high goals. And that there are just as many women these days defending the patriarchy and even bending over backwards to protect it. Like a woman, there's a woman um, in Congress that has like a whole wall full of guns behind her. And she's like, gun, guns are great. You know, they're just trying desperately to reinforce any, to, to completely destroy any feminist critiques of the culture. They're totally on board with everything as macho as possible. And, um, and I, I just, it just breaks my heart. And I hope it doesn't happen to you in your countries. <laughs> but uh, Plato also broke my heart to watch how Athens lost its democracy. And we've been doing a lot of the same things. Um, all right. So what I wanted to get into was, first of all, you know, that Lysis was a, his father, he was a foreigner, um, came from elsewhere. His father was a huge uh, maker of swords and shields. So a military industrial complex in the US, lots of people make lots of money selling military equipment. And so there's, there's a profit motive in us going to war. And the Iraq war was explicitly designed for us to have to get cheap oil in the Mideast. I mean, the mission statement said that. And then the people who took us there were the, the contractors who built the bombs and who uh, uh, the people who fed the troops worked for these companies and they made billions and billions of bucks on war. And so Lysis is a foreigner whose dad makes tons of money on war. He has 1,200 slaves. And um, Lysis is a rhetorician who teaches people how to be persuasive. And so he's teaching the, the next generation of young people how to manipulate and the assembly, how to manipulate the jury so that you can get whatever you want, power, money. But obviously, Lysis is also, you know, written a speech in order to manipulate Phaedrus. So he's giving an example of how good he is at convincing people to do something that he wants, and he doesn't care about them. 
but you have to make it appear like you care about them, right? So he's very good at appearances and he has persuaded Phaedrus. And so Socrates is trying to pull him away from Phaedrus. They're fighting for Phaedrus' soul, right? It's like the struggle between good and evil, the struggle between the mentor who really wants you to think about justice and virtue and the mentor who just wants to sleep with you, but he'll tell you all this wonderful things about how much he cares about you. Um, so this was a big problem in Plato's day. Um, I guess I will also bring up this. I had a, a colleague, another teacher at the school was in psychology and I used to teach uh, with Seneca, I would teach the abusive relationships. And so this particular chart is all about abusive relationships. And it really is pretty much exactly what Lissa says about what the lover will do, right? Emotional abuse, you know, makes you feel inferior, isolates you, intimidates you, uses his privilege as an adult and as somebody who can get you connected to stuff, right? They can make connections for you, uh, threatens you. He talks about that. This is the thing with women is that if they have young children, they will put up with a lot of abuse. Um, and then the sexual abuse and economic abuse, right? They don't let the kid um, become economically self-sufficient. They don't even want him to be physically fit. They want him to be just very, um, you know, dependent, um, not independent. And, and, you know, even there are plenty of men who marry, you know, women much younger who want them to be physically beautiful, don't want them to be physically fit. They, you know, they engage in a lot of these behaviors. So I thought that was interesting. Some things never change. Um, and this was, this is a quote from Aristotle about real friends. Uh, friendship is based on the other's good, another's good. Um, and you admire the friend because they're a good person. And you talk to each other about how you try to live your life to promote the good. That's the foundation for the friendship. Um, then I had, you didn't have to read this at all, but I thought you might be interested in this um, because it, it breaks my heart that um, what has happened, of course, to my country. But what, what happened was, um, those are excerpts from a book by a really well-known scholar named Martha Nussbaum. And she, she wrote about the Phaedrus dialogue. And she writes about, she's arguing that Lysus gives Phaedrus a really good deal and he should take it. Okay, she says, imagine um, the, the analogous choice for a woman today. So she is in philosophy and she's about seven years older than me. And when she went in, maybe there were 12% of the people in philosophy were women. When I went in, it was like 15, but it was really small, right? So she says, uh, analogous choices faced by a young woman entering a male dominated profession that she will be spending the rest of her life in. So she's gonna know these people, right? Cause it's kind of a small group. She's uh, surrounded by potential suitors who are more powerful and more established than she is, right? She doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't occur to her to think this is a power relationship lady. She says, such a woman would want to live a full personal life, but she would be seriously concerned to protect her clarity and autonomy and her chance to live and work on reasonable and non-threatening terms with the people that she's gonna spend her professional life with. Well, 
you know, that's true. That's why those guys should not ask and you should not accept it. Um, but um, she just thinks, she thinks that he's giving her, he says, we do not need to ask how most feminists would advise a female Phaedrus. Uh, given a certain picture of the person in love, um, a picture that is true a good part of the time, right? She says love relationships are like that. And it's just like, it just shows you that professional philosophers are emotionally immature, just like Apollo, just like Zeus. Uh, and she just takes it for granted. And um, uh, so these guys are married, right? She doesn't even mention that they're probably married. They're cheating on their wives. So all of a sudden women are competing against each other and betraying each other because this guy is attracted to them. This is a very, very popular book. This book, probably more trained philosophers read this book at the time than any other book on Plato. Everybody was reading. Um, all right. Uh, okay. This is what um, Nussbaum says. It's a friendly agreement to enjoy in a closely controlled way, a bodily pleasure. <laughs> um, oh, anyway, I just think that um, she, she reveals what was going on in the philosophy profession and what still is going on in the philosophy profession. Philosophers per capita, there aren't very many of them, but per person, there are more philosophy professors that get sent to human resource departments because of complaints for inappropriate sexual um, innuendo or propositions or something like that. And so that has been a corrupting influence on the profession because when I went to college, I thought, I thought PhDs were really mature people. I mean, that was the assumption was that they're living the life of the mind, you know? They're in love with their subject matter. They want you to love their subject matter, not to have sex with you, right? And so to find out, I did find out, you know, I went to a school that was one of the best in the country and I found out that these people are not mature and I got really disappointed. Um, I even left and I went to another school, but then I had a teacher who really was a grown up. Um, but then in graduate school, again, same old thing. And then among professionals, when I go to conferences, the, the people prominent in the profession, they went to all the fancy prep schools, they went to all the Harvard and Yale and all that and they know each other and they don't even respect each other's characters necessarily, right? And it's just, it's still happening. I guess that's what I wanna tell you. It's still happening in the profession. And Nussbaum also says that Lysis was a great defender of democracy. Well, <laughs> democracy meaning freedom to sleep with whoever you want. Plus, he was a foreigner, and, and his dad is, a, is, you know, taking advantage of the fact that the Athenians keep going to war because there's, they have to believe, you know, nobody can defeat us. And so Lissa's father is saying, well, you know, whatever you guys want, I'll sell it to you. He's not giving them advice as a citizen. He's just making money off of them. And Lissa's is just right in there in the game, he doesn't, he's not aware that he's contributing to the decline of Athens and would he even care? The thing about it is eventually when Athens fell and Critias was elected, 
Critias said to the public, that Cephalus, that foreigner, it's his fault for us going to, to war. He made all that money off of us and then we collapsed with our war um, expenses. We're going to take that back. And he confiscated all of Cephalus. Cephalus was dead by then, but he confiscated all of his material things and he killed. Um, I can't remember. He tried to kill Lysus and his brothers. And I, I can't remember if he actually killed Lysus or Polymarchus. I mean, there were more than one son, but Lysus is just completely unaware of how Athens can lose its democracy and collapse and he can get blamed. But it, it's not that difficult to figure out. So the whole time that I'm reading these books, I'm going, my country is falling apart. We are going to elect a dictator. There, there are too many people losing their jobs. The middle class is shrinking. These intellectuals up there at those conferences are oblivious. So I was living this out. Um, and so Martha Nussbaum was, let me see what else she says. Uh, oh yeah, okay. So I have a couple excerpts from a book that I wrote where I answered her. Um, okay, so Plato is showing us that all these relationships are a corrupting influence on the people involved. Nussbaum is not getting Plato's message, even when it's so clear that this corruption led to the fall of Athens. Um, not only does Nussbaum see no problem, she sees an analogy with professional women today. To me, this reflects the same kind of corruption in our society that existed in Athens. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, all of these highly skilled professionals are really motivated by sex power and self-interest. That's what it looks like to students or to outsiders, right? These people, they're just, you know, they're just interested in themselves and they're supposed to represent the love of wisdom. It's very irritating. Um, Lysis is a master of cost benefit calculation, uh, calculating the most efficient means to your own self interest. And, um, and being one of those smart people like Odysseus, who is smart and he gives arguments and reasons and he has strategies, but he's wrong, like Apollo, right? He's emotionally immature and he abuses women. So she didn't, she didn't understand any of that. Um, the other thing she does in the same book, um, let's see, what time is it? Okay, so let me, so Phaedrus and Symposium are two dialogues about Eros. So the Phaedrus is about um, how it had degenerated into just sex with nothing sacred. Um, and then Socrates pulls him out of that. And then he tells him a myth. And he sort of tries to pull him up and say that um, he says, he brings back the gods, right? All of those deities are sacred passions. They're kind, you know, where we get erotically passionate about beauty, but it's not sex. It's what, you know, the vision carrier inspiring us to make, uh, make a city, make an organization, make something beautiful, but not sex. So you have Aphrodite, and then he says that a good mentor will um, guide a student toward his natural sacred calling. And he says um, the mentor, that the student thinks that actually the, the teacher is the cause, which I really believe this, but it's actually the student themselves who project who they are into the teacher, and then the teacher can sort of carry the vision. But it's not the teacher that does it, it's the student doing it. But then uh, what Plato says is, and so he loved 
and knows not what he loves, right? He thinks he loves the person, but he really is in love with this sacred passion. And so that's what a good teacher does. It just helps students know what is it that you're passionate about and then just tells them, you know, that that's, that's what you should go for. That's what you should structure your life around. Um, but to reduce that or to get sex involved in it is really corrupting influence. So then in the, in the middle section, he makes this beautiful myth and it's all sort of crazy, but Phaedrus likes it, right? Phaedrus um, is totally impressed with Socrates and he says, well, I'm gonna have to go back to Lysias and ask him if he can top that. <laughs> you know, that he's making it in a contest. Can you seduce me? Can you seduce me? But Socrates isn't trying to seduce him in the traditional way. He's just trying to seduce him in this vision carrier way. And then in the third section, they're talking about the power of speech writing and speech making. And Phaedrus says, oh, I've read that you really don't have to know anything about the subject matter, that you can just be skilled at punching emotional buttons and winning, you know, getting whatever you want. Of course, that was the huge corrupting influence on Athens. And um, Phaedrus just bought into it. And Socrates, you know, really tries to talk him out of that. And he says, and then he describes a dialectician as opposed to a sophist. He recognizes a kind of soul and he uses the language that will inspire that kind of soul and lead that soul away from the darkness toward the light. And that's what a, um, what a dialectician will do. Okay, so the Phaedrus is about trying to um, trigger what they call the philosophical frenzy, right? It's a kind of dance like Dionysian dancing, right? So in the Greeks, dancing was great. Dancing is sacred because it links mind and body and it gets you emotional. But there is this philosophical frenzy that's this kind of dance where you, you sort of dance your way into you know constantly reminding yourself of what your ultimate passion is and so then uh so this is the process by which socrates tried to lead these young men then in the symposium the symposium comes later on in time and what's happened is that um the symposium actually takes place after after the fall of Athens is Apollodorus, the speaker is remembering, or he heard from somebody else, the story of this banquet that they had had before Athens fell. Okay, so the story is being retold after Athens fell, but it's about before. And so they're trying to think about what was going on in Athens? You know, how did it get to this? And so what they, what it, it's about, it's called a symposium because the Greeks had this tradition that you were encouraged to, and I know at AUW, really, I don't know if they call them symposia, but that all those sort of events where you have speakers talking that's a symposia. And so that's where people could invite other people to their houses for dinner. And they were going to agree that we're gonna have speeches about some serious topic. And it could be like public affairs. It could be like, what is beauty? Just because they want people to constantly be deliberating about what is culture, what is civilization? what is flourishing, what is corruption, right? Constantly talking about serious things. So this was an example where, first of all, the tradition had degenerated into a drinking, a party of drinking and sex. And so when you're invited to one of these, the standard model now 
was that everybody gets drunk and the prostitutes are there and then they go after the prostitutes. That was like, that's how bad it had gotten. And so um, Agathon had just won the contest of the tragedy. He had just written some tragedies and he won and he was pretty young. And so Xenophon was going over to his house and he runs into Socrates. Oh, come on over Socrates, you can come. Um, and so, right, but on the way over there, Socrates stares into space. He goes into this kind of trance where he's thinking about something abstract. And uh, he, he, Xenophon, gets to Agathon's house and says, well, where's Socrates? Oh, he's staring into space. He'll come there pretty soon. And um, the reason why that's important is that Alcibiades also talks about another time when Socrates was staring into space. And that was when they were in a military campaign, right? They were in a war campaign and he was just went out one night and just stared into space all night. Well, why would Plato say that? Well, it's because there is a purely sort of mystical contemplative aspect to philosophy where you can just stare into space for a while. And, you know, you might be working on some abstract problem in your mind. You just lose track of time, right? You just let go of everything and you're just really obsessed. <laughs> and I, I've been this way, um, but, it's always in the context of something concrete and something engaged. So he, he lives a complete life. He can go from contemplation to going to a drinking party to fighting in a war. He, you know, it's this life where you integrate all these things. And in the US, I don't think it's so true at AUW, but in the US, a lot of professors they get rewarded for just sitting in their offices and just focusing on some tiny little thing that isn't something someone is super passionate about in this ancient way. It's just something, some, you know, additional research about blah, 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 that isn't really connected in any meaningful way to living a good life. Uh, sometimes some research is, and I think a lot of AUW students, the research that their professors do is related to women's empowerment or related to public health. So that's lucky because there's a lot of places where it's not, or it's funded by corporations. And the researchers, if their results don't come out in, to favor the corporation, if their research comes out telling them you really shouldn't develop that product, they actually shut down the research. <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, um, they, they get to the, um, they get to the Agathon's house and he's just one. And they start out by saying, I still have a hangover from last night. I can't go, I can't drink anymore. Let's just get rid of the flute players and let's just sit and have a conversation right? Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. And then they said, well, let's just talk about Eros. Let's have speeches about Eros. Oh, yeah, that would be great. And um, Phaedrus says, I've never heard of any speeches about Eros. Nobody ever talks about it. Well, <laughs> Socrates, you know, in other words, he's totally forgotten that experience he had with Socrates because that was about Eros. And um, I don't know if you noticed this, but what people remember and forget tells you a lot about them, <laughs> right? So because Phaedrus didn't really get it, it didn't stick in his mind. If he really had understood that, he would never forget that event he had with Socrates. So it's pretty clear that he didn't choose Socrates, right? Um, if he had chosen the love of wisdom, he would not have said that. So anyway, he, um, he gives the first speech. And the key here is that what they do 
is what the tragedies tell you not to do. They show you not to do it. They idealize something, right? And they don't look at the dark side. Um, just like, um, I, think I, I think I said the Trojans, you know, they were in love with wealth, but they didn't look at the dark side of that. And then they, they condemned the Achaeans because they cared about power. No, no, we're, we're civilized. And the Achaeans cared about power and they were so disgusted uh, when Priam came and tried to bribe them thinking they cared about wealth. Oh, no, no, we're way better than that. But they're just totally into power. And so just all this idealizing yourself, demonizing the other and denying the fact that you have a dark side. So all the speeches violate that basic principle. So, but they all are afraid of something. There is a darkness there, but they won't address it. So Phaedrus, his speech is um, the love of two comrades at, at, at arms in a war. And this happens, you know, People, soldiers will bond with each other because they're in such terrible circumstances. But Sparta had a tradition where they actually would pair them up and they'd even have sexual relations. Like they were that intimate, but the point of it was that you wouldn't humiliate yourself in front of your friend in war, right? So you would definitely stay out there on the field no matter what. Um, yeah, that's right. So Sam, that's okay. And Liz, that's great. Um, so Phaedrus, what happened was he rejected being, uh, being Lys's sex toy, right? I'm not going to be that sex toy for an old man, right? I'm going to be tough. I'm going to be a tough guy. And so now he's all into this machismo stuff because he's afraid or because, you know, he's got to prove to everybody that he's tough. And um, it turns out he ruined his life because one night he got drunk with Alcibiades that I'll tell you about, but he, and they went and destroyed all the, um, they destroyed a bunch of um, statues to Hermes um, the god Hermes actually has an erect penis, a huge erect penis, because Hermes is the messenger between the men and the gods, and all of those passions are erotic. But what he did is he got drunk and knocked all the penises off and got ostracized, right? He was never given the kind of status that he could have had or could make a contribution, right? He self-destructed, basically. He was corrupted by his elders. Um, but he represents a young man who's so into proving that he's macho that he doesn't question whether his elders are actually should go to war or whether they should engage in this degree of violence in war. He never questions, does whatever he's told. So that's a kind of, you know, blind ignorance and that'll ruin a democracy. You have to have the soldiers being able to be critical, even though they'll obey in a war situation, they have to be allowed to reflect and make sure their society isn't going too far, which Athens was. Okay, the second speech is by Pausanias. He's an older guy. And he's in a sexual relation with Agathon, the younger guy. But this time, Pausanias, he, he talks about the heavenly Aphrodite as opposed to that earthly Aphrodite, right? And so it's a lot like Lysias' speech, except that he calls it Aphrodite. But he's the heavenly guy. He's the really kind-hearted older guy who really respects the younger guy. And what he's worried about is the way that younger men take advantage of older men and they take their money and they, and they ditch them, right? 
they, so he's worried about getting used in the other way. So if you put those two together, it's like the whole relationship is completely corrupt. But so Pausanias puts himself on this pedestal because he's, you know, the gentle, civilized, dirty old man. Um, but he's worried about getting used by the younger guy. So he's got his own insecurity. So then the third one is Eryximachus. He's a doctor. And he, um, all right, so Aristophanes, the comedian, gets the hiccups before, when it's his turn to talk. And so Eryximachus has to take his place. But you can tell that the reason Aristophanes has the hiccups is because he's drinking and eating, you know, eating too fast, drinking too much. But Eryximachus tells him what to do. And he gives him three things, okay? Do this, if this doesn't work, do this. If this doesn't work, do this. And so it's clear that there's, uh, Plato talks about two different kinds of medicine in uh, the way it's practiced in Athens. One of them is a person is basically healthy, but they really feel sick. They go to the doctor. The doctor gives them a potion to purge the poison in their body. And they throw up and they have diarrhea and they either get up three days later and go back to work or they die. That's it. You're healthy, you work, you die. Well, then there's this other kind of medicine where you make a whole lot of money pandering to people's bad habits and letting people do whatever they want. And when they get sick, you have all these remedies that are basically just enabling those people. You don't do any prevention. You don't do wellness. You don't do diet and exercise. And that's the kind of doctor Eryximachus is. And that too undermined Athenian democracy. And America is really in a bad way. Like two thirds, three quarters of our healthcare is unnecessary. It's based on diet, lack of exercise, obsession with sports that, you know, kids get hurt because they're trying so hard. Anyway, but that's Eryximachus. So that's the corruption of, um, Eros, he, his speech is to Harmony, which is the child of Ares and Aphrodite. So we did talk about the two most threatening, uh, biggest threats to civilization. Remember, sex and aggression, Eros, uh, Aphrodite, and Ares. So Phaedrus has worshipped Ares, Pausanias is worshipping Aphrodite, Eryximachus is working, worshiping the child of Eros and Aphrodite, the illicit child, right? That's when they got together and they felt, you know. And then um, Aristophanes, the comedian, has this other view of hermaphrodites. He says, in the old days, uh, there wasn't male and female. There were just this, this union and they rolled all around and they got very powerful. And so the gods uh, cut them in half and moved their genitals around to the front <laughs> and tied up the wound. And that's what your navel is, kind of tie up the wound. I mean, it's a comedy, right? The thing about it is that he says, that's why people spend their lives looking for their other half, right? Because they were cut in half. And you know that people look for their soulmate, right? The thing is, if you really look at Aristophanes' speech, the way it makes people behave is it's very machismo kind of sex. It's just that, are you my soulmate? I think I'm gonna have sex with you and check it out. Nope, I guess not. Okay, and it's really a lot of very promiscuous and he emphasizes masculine sex, not passive sex. So again, it's funny, it looks funny. Uh, Aristophanes says it to be popular, but underneath that, it legitimizes really harmful behavior. 
really abusive behavior, really uh, promiscuous behavior. If you remember all those stories about Zeus and Apollo raping and pillaging, that was all trying to convince you you should tie your sexuality to Hera, to the long-term relationship. Because if you don't, it does so much harm. Obviously, these guys didn't get the message. Then the next one is Agathon. And he is the Kim Kardashian or whoever the latest sex goddess is. I don't know. You know, he's young and he's physically beautiful. And he talks about that um, Aphrodite turns all the other gods on their heads. So in the Phaedrus, Aphrodite is the bottom of the ladder. First you're attracted to beauty and then you can go up the ladder. And um, Agathon says that Aphrodite controls Aries, right? It's pleasure and wealth that decide going to war or not. Aphrodite controls uh, Zeus. Aphrodite controls everybody, all right? Well, that was what was going on in Athens. Pleasure and wealth were driving wars, were causing people to be impulsive, dissipated. They didn't care about developing citizen consciousness, about being responsible, about thinking about the rule of law, about thinking about the impact of what they did on other people. They're just impulsive and they're driven by pleasure. So Agathon, uh, gives that speech. And um, he says, oh, Aphrodite, he says, I disagree with Pausanias. Aphrodite isn't this gentle old man. Aphrodite is young and beautiful. And uh, <laughs> yeah, right. He's in a relationship with Pausanias and he later ditches Pausanias for a machismo guy. Anyway, so Agathon is worshiping the Kim Kardashians or the sex goddess of the week thing. And um, everybody thinks that's great. And then Socrates takes his turn and he is has this ladder of love. First you love a physical body, then you love all physical bodies. You just learn to appreciate the beauty of the body. Then you love a beautiful soul even if it isn't a beautiful body. And Socrates did not have a beautiful body. Then you love laws and institutions. You know, you appreciate the order that laws and institutions bring to society, which I do. When I first read that, I didn't because I lived in the 60s. But now I really do. They're much more reliable than people. Um, and then after that, love of knowledge love of the sciences. And so again, he's trying to bring back the Greek, you know, the Olympian gods, those different, but he's doing it, he's not calling them the gods anymore, but he's trying to get people to go up to love what really matters in life. Well, then Alcibiades breaks in and he was the most um, gifted, person, but he completely abused his talents. And he used his talent for, for speaking persuasively to go up in front of the assembly and convince the Athenians that they should go to war in, uh, in Sicily. It doesn't matter. But, but it was very self-destructive. They didn't have enough people. They didn't have enough resources. But Alcibiades knew he could manipulate them. He could watch Athens destroy itself. And he says, I can't resist that temptation. I love manipulating people in the assembly. And Socrates was trying desperately to be his mentor to prevent him from doing that because he knew Alcibiades had all this ability and if it wasn't directed toward loving wisdom, the city was really going to be hurt by him. And it, Alcibiades says, whenever I see Socrates, it makes me feel so guilty because I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. But I go to the assembly and it's so easy to punch these people's buttons. They're so vain and they're so full of themselves. I can't resist. 
And so he did that, right? He sent them off to a, a bad war. And and um, then he he broke the statues, you know, the penises, and he got banished. He would get banished, and then he'd get brought back because they needed him. They had this love-hate relationship with him. But finally, they banished him one more time. He told the Spartans some secrets. He, he betrayed them. He was a traitor. So the main point is that this is what happened to Eros. And the title symposium is ironic, right? Those symposia were designed to help people cultivate citizen consciousness, and it has been completely corrupted. It's not a symposium. It appears to be a symposium. It is absolutely not really a symposium. Okay, so it's 1040. Um, I will, that's the main theme is what happened to Eros. And you can link that back to the myths and you can link that back to the tragedies, but the Athenians did not understand their tradition and it was a great tradition and they threw it away and it breaks my heart. And so did Martha Nussbaum. She loved Alcibiades. She loved Lysias. She loved moral relativism. She says that she prefers the sophists and we elected Trump. So as far as I'm concerned, it's all the same thing. And it, it was really frustrating <laughs> to live through all that. Okay, let you go. Bye-bye. I was going to meet with, who was I? Poppy. I was going to meet with Poppy. Not what? professor, because I have uh, I have a registration uh, from till okay. 10. So I need another time, okay? Okay. That's fine. You can, Nahida, did you, can you meet with me now? Professor. Yeah. Professor, I, like I was just confused. Uh, like uh, you have given so many <clears throat> things to write like classwork. So, professor, what is the difference between finance paper and research paper? Well, the research paper, okay. I do have, you know, a lot of directions on the stream, right? So if you look at the stream, it, it really does say a lot, tells you all the details, okay? But I mean, ever since the first day of class, there was a research paper that was basically should have been written a long time ago, but at least a thousand words, at least three sources, it was supposed to be on some uh, some professional, uh, whatever you think you might be when you, as a professional, like if you think you're going into business, you study women in business. If you think you're going into education, you can study sexism in education or sexism in the way women uh, have access, right? Do they do they get promoted? Can they become supervisors? Can they become policymakers? Or if you think you're going to be, I mean, I had all those, all, I had all those papers of students from last year that I put onto. Are you following the streams? Because, yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 yes ma Remember, there was the one women in literature. Uh, one was on child brides. So it was just supposed to be like that. And then the final paper is supposed to be um, what you learned from the class. Um, I'm trying to remember if I watered it down or I just posted something that- Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I, I just look into it, but like, uh, like uh, when Fahima was talking, like I just got confused because like uh, last time, uh, last meeting I just wrote. So like I wrote something about uh, um, on the research paper. Uh, like I have submitted just before the class. I wrote about like a dream job. Uh, okay, and I have submitted it. So I need to change it, I think. Well, let's see. What do you mean by a dream job? Um, 
I mean, it doesn't sound to me like it's, you have to redo it necessarily. Um, Let's see. So what did you write about? Uh, uh, dream job. Green job. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Go ahead. Green job is a good, good thing. Uh, Ma'am, I have already submitted the paper. Like, okay. uh, I, uh, uh, but like, I'm still uh, worried. Like, if it, it might be wrong. What so would make I... it wrong? What would make it wrong? No, no. Uh, like, uh, I have written uh, to some extent. Uh, like, uh, I have written everything, but I didn't put any type of uh, source. But I have mentioned two names of like professional. Uh, of that profession uh, to uh, two famous people of that profession only i have mentioned the name and else i have written everything of my own yeah no you do need three references three it, references it's a research paper so yeah it does need that ma'am it will be okay if i write about my dream job and like uh, i give a research on it yeah, your dream job or green job dream yeah okay well as long as as long as it you know you have some research about that job yeah sure what is your dream job well i last time i said i like i was i wanted to become a designer fashion oh, yeah, designer yeah. okay i just have to be reminded yeah okay so then you look up you know women designers in southeast asia or in um India, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, because I'm sure there are, you know, and uh, who they are. And no, there. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, okay, ma'am. Um, ma'am, uh, like uh, I profess and like I personally follow to uh, like to means like I have an like I'm following a designer named uh, Sabyasachi Mukherjee. He's a renowned uh, uh, designer of India. And like uh, he has, uh, like he designed wedding clothes, wedding clothes and as like civil clothes, but like he's professionally desi designing wedding dresses. So like he is famous all over the world, even like, uh, I mean, his clothes are sell in a large hues and his work are really, uh, uh, unique so I like really like